It wasn't so long ago that we would tell people that it was good to take disability leave from work and to cut back on activity and to try to spend more time at rest, including bed rest. And that's precisely the wrong thing you should be telling people in this situation. There are so many uh, benefits from uh, exercise during cancer treatment, both in terms of reducing the risk of breast cancer death, as well as improvement in quality of life. I've always been a believer in exercise, and now I'm even more of a believer because I do think that it helped me get through the darker days of my treatment and diagnosis. Um, and um, it continues to keep me going and to, to get me positive and energized. It's just such an empowering opportunity for patients, and I think even in the instance of altered body image from surgery or the, the feelings that are associated with hair loss from chemotherapy. I see people really thriving in their fitness and their wellness from being part of a physical activity program. It's not an option anymore. I, I hear loud and clear that, that the incidence of recurrence, the quality of my life, um, really requires me to stay physically fit, or at least to the extent that I am able. There's no question that exercise is good for our physical and mental health. We're learning that exercise is good medicine for treating many conditions, arthritis, back pain, obesity, and depression, to name a few. Now we can add breast cancer to the list. An important study by Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital has shown that for women who have been treated for breast cancer, exercise helps reduce the chance that the cancer will come back. What they found was that in patients who uh, exercised um, by walking three hours a week or more uh, and who had cancers that were hormone receptor positive reduced their risk of breast cancer death by half. And in absolute terms, that translates to about a 6% absolute reduction in the risk of breast cancer death over a period of 10 years. So um, exercise significantly decreases your risk of death over uh, the period of time immediately after a breast cancer diagnosis. Other studies have shown that exercise speeds recovery from surgery, decreases side effects of chemotherapy and radiation, and helps reduce risk of osteoporosis. For patients who've never exercised, I believe that for many of them, a cancer diagnosis is an opportunity for reflection where they can look at things like diet and physical activity and make a lifestyle change that will be beneficial for them into survivorship. So I think it certainly is possible for non-exercisers to become exercisers. We see it all the time. And it really becomes a positive lifestyle change that the patient can feel good about into their survivorship and looking at the rest of their life as a healthier, more active life. Exercise is best defined by considering its three classifications, aerobic, strength training, and flexibility. Aerobic exercise is brisk activity that requires the heart and lungs to work harder to meet the body's increased oxygen demand. It promotes the circulation of oxygen through the blood. Walking and cycling, jogging and swimming, and cross-country skiing are examples of aerobic exercises. In this video, we are primarily describing the benefit of aerobic exercise, with walking being the most popular. But all three types of exercise have important benefits for breast cancer survivors. Strength training is another form of exercise. It uses resistance, like weights, to make muscles work harder than they're used to. Strength training builds muscle strength and endurance. Flexibility, or stretching exercises, are beneficial to recover range of motion and to counteract the long-term effects of radiation, which can cause muscle tightening up to two years after treatment. Fatigue is the number one symptom in cancer survivorship, and it's really multifaceted. 
The blood counts can be a problem. The sleep pattern of a patient can be a problem. Stress, anxiety, and depression can cause symptoms of fatigue. But what we do know in the literature, time and time again, exercise has been proven to be beneficial in the presence of cancer-related fatigue. So some level of physical activity should be prescribed as a standard of care for cancer survivors really at the time of diagnosis. Sometimes I laugh, they look at me like I have two heads sometimes when I suggest that during chemotherapy they start an exercise program. But ultimately once they try it and once it's prescribed properly and they tolerate it well and they feel the benefits from it, they become a believer and they know that it's the right thing for them to do. There's a very strong tie-in between obesity and a sedentary lifestyle and, uh, and the risk of breast cancer, as well as the risk of a number of other cancers. So breast cancer is definitely an obesity-related illness. Um, your risk of getting breast cancer is higher if you've gained a significant amount of weight since adolescence. And the heavier you are, the greater your risk of developing breast cancer. I, I have, in fact, gained weight. And it has, in fact, been a real challenge for me to try to manage it. Um, the things I used to do where I could manage my weight and it wouldn't be an issue, don't, they don't work anymore. I, I have to step it up a level, and I have to step it up um, in terms of my frequency. Exercise plays a significant part in the weight management for cancer survivors. We put patients into menopause, whether it be surgical or chemical me menopause. We give them treatments that change their metabolism. We give them treatments that make them feel like they want to be less active. So there's a lot of factors that go into weight gain. We know that women who are sedentary uh, and who are overweight tend to have higher circulating levels of insulin. And the insulin appears to be a growth factor for many cancers, including breast cancer. So uh, we think that perhaps losing weight and exercising regularly may decrease insulin levels and therefore make cancers more susceptible to uh, chemotherapy and hormone therapy. I will say that it helped to keep me positive and upbeat and um, there were some days when really I didn't feel like exercising and I can say honestly that I know that when I was done I felt much better. I used it as a time to be alone, a time to get angry, a time to cry, a time to try to put things in perspective. I've seen this in my own practice that the women who exercise regularly have uh, a better outlook on life and are able to cope with adversity better than the women who don't exercise regularly. Osteoporosis is an important concern for women who've been treated for breast cancer. Osteoporosis is a loss of bone mass. Bones become porous and fragile. The chemotherapy in and of itself reduces the bone density by an average of about 7%. Um, furthermore, many of our chemotherapy programs will cause menopause in uh, premenopausal women, and an earlier menopause makes women more susceptible to developing osteoporosis. And then finally, many of the hormone blocking drugs that we use reduce estrogen levels and therefore decrease bone density, um, even in women who are already pre uh, postmenopausal. Strength training builds muscles and helps increase bone density. Walking is both aerobic and strength building for the legs. Resistive exercise for the arms can build up the strength not only in the arms, but also in the upper half of the spine, which is an area that's affected by osteoporosis. I think that the simplest form of weight-bearing exercise is walking, but that also um, uh, weight training and calisthenics um, are very good. Recent research shows resistive exercise like weightlifting also benefits patients who have lymphedema, which is swelling that sometimes develops as a result of having lymph nodes removed. Does that feel okay? Yeah, I'm getting a little tired. All right. In starting to exercise after surgery, 
be sure to follow the advice and instructions of your physician and physical therapist. Unless there are complications, most women who have had surgery can begin walking within a few days. Generally, women who have had mastectomies or axillary node dissections should not push recovering shoulder range of motion until approximately three weeks after surgery. Patients who have had reconstructive surgery can usually start moderate walking within the first week. We think of exercise like medicine. If it's the proper prescription, the right dosage, patients can generally always find an exercise program that's comfortable with them. And if they enjoy it, they're more likely to stick with it. They need to have a comfortable environment, comfortable clothing. Ideally, having someone else to exercise with them can be very helpful. Um, and really doing things that are comfortable, you know, avoiding things that cause pain or strain, um, and setting some realistic goals. I tell people to start walking if they haven't engaged in walking uh, in the recent past, I have them start slow, uh, perhaps five or ten minutes a day, but every day on a regular basis. And I tell them that their goal should be about three hours a week of walking. A physical therapist can adapt an exercise program so it works for women who have problems that may stand in the way of normal exercise. Arthritis of the knee or hip, for instance. You really have to motivate yourself some time to get out and exercise, but in the end, at the end of it, you will feel so much better. And you don't have to join a gym. You don't have to exercise with a group. I live in a, a, a rural area, and, and my exercise was walking out the door with my dog and um, walking, you know, around the block. In reality, finding that piece of enjoyment in their exercise is really key. And so um, if it is something out of doors or if it is a class, perhaps they like to take, you know, a group exercise session that has a lot of energy to it, there are numerous ways where they can find something. But if they haven't found it, they need to keep trying until they find it. I had to begin to see exercise as something to enjoy and to appreciate as opposed to something I really hated to do that I would not look forward to. There are moments I don't look forward to getting on the treadmill, but it's okay, it's an hour, and it's okay, and I'll watch TV and make the best of it. It's very funny because it's not really a place you'd wanna be. You know, it's the basement, <laughs> and I have the uh, TV, and so I try to, you know, I try to, and I have music, and I just try to make it as pleasant as it can be, and you know what, it's an investment I make. And when I was most nauseous or most tired, uh, the route that I would normally take, it's about two and a half miles, would normally take me about 45 minutes to walk or maybe a little less. At my most horrible moments, took me, you know, an hour and a half, maybe two hours. I mean, it was really excruciatingly slow, but um, when I was done, I felt good and I felt like I can do this. It was, it was very positive. Other than walking, which is my number one exercise, I have a lot of other things on the fringe that I try to do. In the winter, I, I do snowshoeing. My youngest son got me a bike and is pretty intent that I'm going to be a biker. Not only do I exercise by myself, but there is a weekly group that um, consists of breast cancer um, women like myself, and we range in age and in different diagnoses, and we exercise once a week. I garden a lot, um, and there's actually a lot of strength uh, training um, to the gardening um, between the edging and the, you know, pushing the wheelbarrow and um, getting up and down. There are probably some people who should um, um, have some evaluation of cardiac function before they start a regular exercise program. But if otherwise you're in good health and, um, and you don't have any um, active issues with heart disease, I don't 
see a problem with in, uh, embarking on an exercise program. I do have to be careful um, when I'm in the garden to watch out. I want, need to watch out for lymphedema. So you wear gloves all the time, which I didn't really do. And I, I am careful and if I'm going to really be um, kind of uh, getting in there, I'll, I'll wear a long sleeve shirt because you have to watch out for scratches uh, on your arm, on my left arm in particular. Whether you're just starting an exercise program or if you've been exercising faithfully, there are some safety measures a patient should take into consideration. As Pam said, if you have had your lymph nodes removed, you have an increased risk of infection on that side. So it is important to protect yourself from cuts and scratches. Don't exercise if you haven't been eating or if you haven't been drinking much fluid, if you have diarrhea, or if you've been vomiting. You may be dehydrated. Talk to your physician before you start or continue exercising if you have any new onset of dizziness, pain, or shortness of breath. Be sure to talk to your physician if you have any signs of redness, swelling, or tenderness in your calf. These could be signs that you have a blood clot. If you start to exercise during chemotherapy, your providers will talk to you about some special considerations. If you are anemic, you may need to slow down and avoid higher intensity activities. If your white blood cell counts are too low, you should avoid public gyms and swimming pools until your immune system recovers. If platelets are too low, you may be advised to avoid high impact activities. Safety warnings considered, most patients can begin a moderate exercise program without difficulty. Even in the case of advanced cancer, exercise has many benefits but the patient should have clearance from her physician and consult with a physical therapist. In their guidelines for physical activity and nutrition during and after cancer treatment, the American Cancer Society recommends that cancer survivors exercise at a moderate to vigorous level of physical activity for a minimum of 30 minutes a day for five to seven days out of the week. Research has shown that vigorous physical activity for greater periods of time per day, up to 45 or 60 minutes per day, decreases the incidence rate of both breast and colon cancer. So this really should be part of the standard recommendations that cancer providers give their patients, just like it's part of the standard recommendations that every primary care physician gives their patients now. Because a healthier lifestyle will not only reduce your risk of dying from breast cancer, but it also reduces your risk of dying from heart attack or stroke. Um, it reduces your risk of developing diabetes down the road. I am a stage 3B. I did have all those positive lymph nodes. So I know I can't change that. There's nothing about those tumor markers that I can change. I can change, I can take control of the things that give me that little edge in exercise, diet, lifestyle. Those all give me an edge. Of the entire time that I was in treatment, which was close to five months, I only missed three days, and that's because I was just too sick. I couldn't. If there's anything that I could say again to women going through this, it's, it's take the time to care about yourself. Thank you.